What are the challenges facing Australia? And I'll finish up here, Chairman. Firstly, climate change. Should Australia adopt the CPRS or is there a better way? And anyone who's heard me speak before will know my answer to that. And then how do we deal with the large relative price changes that we inevitably are going to see coming out of China and India? So in terms of climate change, again, let's just remember what we should be doing. We should be designing a system that focuses on risk management. How do we get industries to finance investments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? This is not the government that's going to pay for this. It's too small, globally and nationally. It's the private sector, so we have to encourage the investments. We need long-term price signals. We need long-term markets where risks can be managed. We don't want people to have no risk. We want people to try and take risks to develop technologies and then get a payoff and get to keep it if they're successful. We need an independent central bank of carbon to manage climate change and to pull it away from politics. And I've written extensively on that. The CPRS has many flaws, but these can be fixed. We need to preserve the balance sheets of households and firms by giving them the emission rights over a long period of time, but have them evaporate over time. We need to announce a large deep cuts target and then smooth the costs by allowing um, short-term annual permits to, to hold the, the price at a given pre-announced level in the short term. We should divorce the climate policy from the fiscal accounts because you'll end up with what we've seen in the last two weeks where we see numbers dramatically change the politics of climate policy. And we should adopt a hybrid, but I won't say any more than that. Now, Australia in the terms of trade boom, there is a big period of adjustment coming. I don't think this is permanent, but I think we're talking decades. How should we respond? One aspect of this is how do you do demand management policy when there's this big, big demand for one particular part of our economy's production? Can we use monetary policy to try and stabilise the economy when demand is surging so dramatically? I don't think so, but it may be the only tool we have left. What we do need is a way of dampening domestic demand and a way of hedging the risk that this boom will go away like it did last time and the time before and the time before that. How do you do it? One way may be a sovereign wealth fund where you invest all of that additional revenue coming from the resources boom offshore. The problem with that approach is that it's actually government controlled and there are a lot of philosophical questions why you may actually want to allocate that additional revenue to individuals in, in, in individual retirement accounts and have them manage this, uh, the national wealth rather than the government. So I'll finish up here by saying that there are many economic and political challenges facing Australia in the world in coming decades. Uh, the key here is that we have to devise strategies for risk management. We don't know what the world would look like in a decade or two or three. We have some broad scenarios that I've painted for you here, but they could well be wrong. And we shouldn't just rely on our forecast being right. And there's been a been a, a tendency, particularly coming from parts of finance and treasury, that all we have to do is get it right next time. Well, we won't get it right next time. We won't get the greenhouse emission projections right in 2020. They will be different to what my model says and what treasury says. Um, the key is to make the institutional design changes now so that we channel private incentives appropriately. So this is a mix of the government and the role of the private sector. And the key here is in all of this analysis is to make sure that we're balancing the expected costs with the expected benefits of various types of policies rather than exploiting short-term political opportunism. And my website is available, sensiblepolicy.com. Thank you. Uh, Warwick, uh, Phil Lasker from the ABC. I, I was interested in your comment towards the end when you talked about domestic demand management and you were saying that monetary policy may be the only uh, option left to us in, in demand management. Uh, why do you say that? Well, I can't actually talk too much about um, monetary policy and demand management, but we've seen from the previous boom and bust that fiscal policy wasn't used very effectively to manage aggregate demand. We had tax cuts being given at a period where we thought that the terms of trade was going to keep rising. So there is a, there, people, people do argue there is a philosophical view from the right that all we do is give all the revenue to the individuals in the economy and they'll make the right optimal decisions and, and you won't have a problem. The reality is that that's not the way the economy actually works. And there is a role for, I think, pulling some of those resources out of the economy in the hands of individuals in terms of how you manage it, but actually just to hand the money as tax cuts uh, is, is just going to crank more aggregate demand into the economy than, than I would feel comfortable with. The Australian dollar um, has appreciated 23% against the Chinese yuan over the last 12 months and 31% since March. You talk a lot about protectionism as a trade or a tariff issue. 
Um, there's a lot of writing now about the, the UN peg to the US being an exchange rate protectionism bigger than neighbour policy under another name. Warwick, what do you think about the issue of exchange rates and how it's going to settle into the new economic order following the GFC? Well, I won't talk about the Australian dollar, but I think the Chinese are actually realising that it's hurting them very much to be doing what they're doing in terms of what it means for domestic credit expansion. Uh, China would be clearly in their national interest to let their currency appreciate. Not necessarily float, but have it appreciating relative to the US dollar. Um, there are Chinese special interests involved in, in doing that. The reason they're not doing it is partly to do with uh, worry about the foreign reserve losses, several trillion dollars worth of exposure sitting in US government bonds. Once they do do that, there's a concern in the US that capital will flow out of the US because they will flow back to China. There's all sorts of complex political issues associated with it. My view is that the more currencies are let to float, the better. And it's not just China, by the way. Most of the developing countries are actually holding on to a US dollar, which is inevitably, inevitably with large standard errors around it, inevitably going to be depreciating given the adjustment that's required on their external accounts. Now, in the new world order, this is where the international institutional design is very important. And the International Monetary Fund was devised in, as one of the Bretton Woods institution to manage imbalances and shifts of resources across national borders. There has to be a refocusing of the IMF. There has to be a change in the structure of the IMF in terms of the management. The developing countries have to have a much bigger say in the way the IMF runs. There is even a pretty good case to have a, uh, a, a new global uh, reserve currency and it won't be an individual national currency because if you look at every one of these national currencies, it's not clear which one could be the reserve. But we could revisit the old literature um, that Robert Triffin and others wrote about, about creating a, a basket world currency.